So I went to interview Professor Earl Miller at MIT. He's one of the leading neuroscientists in the world. And he said to me, there's one thing about the human brain you've got to understand more than anything else. You can only consciously think about one or two things at a time. That's it. This is a fundamental limitation of the human brain. The human brain has not significantly changed mm -hmm. in the last 40,000 years. It ain't going to change on any time scale. We're going to see you can only think about one or two things at a time. But what's happened is we've fallen as a culture for a mass delusion. The average teenager now believes they can follow six or seven forms of media at the same time. So what happens is, and this has been studied a huge amount, scientists get people into labs and they get them to think they're doing more than one thing at a, at a time. And what they discover every time is the same thing. You're not doing more than one thing at a time. You're very rapidly juggling between the tasks. And, you know, your consciousness kind of papers over it. So you don't, you, you feel like you're doing the things at the same time, but you're not. And what they find is when you try and do more than one thing at a time, something called the switch cost effect kicks in. Everyone should know this term, the switch cost effect, because it's harming your life. Mm -hmm. The switch cost effect shows when you try and do more than one thing at a time, you will do all the things you're trying to do much less competently. You'll make more mistakes. You'll remember less of what you do. You'll be less creative. And, and this feels like a small effect when you hear about it. You, think, you can go, yeah, okay, I get it. But how big can that be? The effect, it, it shocked me when I learned about it. The effect is enormous. I'll give you uh, two examples of just small studies backed by a much wider body of evidence that have found this. Um, Hewlett Packard, the printer company, got a scientist in to study their workforce. And he split their workers into two groups. And the first group was told, just get on with your task, whatever it is, and you're not going to be interrupted. And the second group was told, get on with your task, but you're going to have to answer a fairly heavy amount of email and phone calls. So pretty much how most of us live our lives. And then at the end of it, they tested the IQ of both groups. The group that had not been interrupted scored on average 10 IQ points higher than the group that had been interrupted. To give you a sense of how big an effect that is now, um, if you get stoned, your IQ goes down in the short term by five points. So being chronically distracted is twice as bad for your IQ, your intelligence, mm. in the short term as getting stoned. Right? That's a big effect. Or look at another example. Professor Larry Rosen discovered if you receive eight text messages an hour, which doesn't sound like very much to me, that lowers your brain power for the main thing you're trying to focus on by 30%. These are huge effects. I would argue we're most of us are losing about that 30% yeah. most of the time. This is why Professor Miller said to me, we're living in a perfect storm of cognitive degradation at the moment as a result of constant distraction. And there's, there's kind of two levels at which we can respond to this. Like we said, there's defense. So you mentioned, I own something called a K-Safe, right? Yeah. I should totally be paying, being paid commission by these mm -hmm. guys because I keep recommending it. K-Safe is a plastic safe. Uh, you take off the lid, you put in your phone, you put on the lid and you, do you have one, Rich? No, but I know what it. I know okay, exactly. I know what it is. Okay, yeah, this, yeah, is gonna, yeah. this is going to. I do use freedom though. Yeah. So you turn the thing, the the dial at the top, and it will lock away your phone for anything between five minutes and a whole day. I will not sit down and watch a movie with my partner unless we both imprison our phones. If anyone comes around for dinner, I will insist they imprison their phone. I use that. I use that lockbox for four hours a day. Otherwise, I would never have been able to write my book Stolen Focus. Right. So. And there's loads of things like that we can do in terms of changing what we eat and a whole range of other things. Um, but you're right, and this is where Tristan, the layer that Tristan and other, other people who've been at the heart of Silicon Valley and are now trying to expose this are, are so important. At the moment, we are using technologies that are extraordinarily sophisticated in figuring out how to get us to pick up our phone as often as possible and scroll as long as possible. And I can talk more about that if you like. And I know you have a lot of thoughts on this as well, Rich, and saying you cover a lot on, on the podcast. Uh, but we can deal with that, right? We, there's absolutely practical ways we can deal with that that I can talk about if you like. Mm -hmm. I'm conscious I'm giving long answers. Yeah, no, I definitely want to get into that. But just, to, you, you know, in response to what you just said, mm -hmm. it kind of dovetails into a conversation around, around flow as well, which is mm -hmm. the antithesis of this distracted state of of multitasking. And, you know, as a parent of teenagers, I can tell you, uh, you know, it's like they're, they're kind of like default MO is to lay on their bed in their room. And, you know, there's an iPad, there's a laptop and there's a phone. And there's generally a FaceTime happening with one of their friends where, I don't know if you know this, but like one thing teens do is they just have the FaceTime on in the background, yeah. especially during the pandemic. So they sure. feel like they're with their friend and they're not even really interacting that much. It's just comforting to know like your friend is laying on their bed in, in their house 
And every once in a while, you can check in. One of them's doing homework. The other one's watching The Office and maybe, you know, playing a video. There's like all these inputs are happening at one while the scrolling, of course, and all of that. So, you know, I've witnessed firsthand, uh, you know, this dynamic. And it's hugely problematic because it's, it is on some level implicitly informing them that they can do all of these things well or fine at the same time, which is an illusion. And anybody who's tried to, you know, sit down and execute on a project, particularly creative people. I mean, the easiest example is writing a book. If you're in that state and you're focused and you are experiencing a certain level of flow in that process, you're doing a painting or a sculpture or writing a song or whatever it is, uh, and you get interrupted, that um, switch cost effect is very real. Like you've experienced that because it's not like, oh, I got interrupted. Even if it's someone knocks on your door and says, hey, can you, you know, don't forget to go to the grocery store or whatever. The amount of time it takes to get back into that flow state, you can't just switch it on and off. Like you, it, it, I mean, it's like a half an hour before you feel like you can tap into where you were before that seemingly innocuous interruption. Yeah, this is so important, Rich, and what you're saying is so right. And the, for people who don't know about flow states, everyone listening will have experienced a flow state in your life, in their lives. So a flow state is when you're doing something and you really get into it. You get into the zone and your sense of time falls away, your sense of ego falls away, and you're just in it. The way one rock climber put it is um, when you're in flow, you feel like you are the rock you're climbing. And, and flow is really important for the attention debate because flow is simultaneously the deepest form of attention we can provide. When you're in a flow state, your attention is fully on it. And it's once you get into it, it's the easiest form of attention to provide, right? When you're in a flow state, it's not like memorizing facts for an exam. It's not like, oh, okay, what is that? What's that? It just, it's like a gusher happening. of attention mm -hmm. inside all of us. So obviously one thing I wanted to understand is, okay, if it's a gusher of attention inside all of us, where do we drill? How do we get it? So I went to interview Professor Mahali Cheeksetmihai. You have no idea how long it took me to learn how to say mm -hmm. that. Uh, who was the, the man who coined the phrase flow states in the 1960s, a completely one of the most important psychologists of the last half century, I would argue. And he spent 50 years studying flow states. Uh, sadly, he, I think I did the last interview he ever did because he died shortly afterwards. And, um, and Professor Cheeksetmihai said to me, many important things about flow. But for me, I think there are three that would be really useful for your listeners and your viewers if they want to maximize their chances of getting into flow. So there's three things you can do. I mean, there's lots, but I would say these are the three most important. The, the first is you've got to choose one goal and filter out everything else you're trying to do, right? If you're trying to do more than one thing at a time, you won't get into flow. So you've got to narrow your focus. I want to paint this canvas. I want to climb this rock. I want to write this chapter. You've got to do one thing. The second thing is the goal you choose has got to be meaningful to you, right? So for you, it might be painting a canvas. For me, I, I can't paint for shit, right? It would, I would normally get to flow on that. For you, it might be going for a run. Mm -hmm. uh, the only time I ever went for a run is when I once thought KFC was going to close and I got there and it was <laughs> it had another hour to go. Waste of time that was. So, and you know, so different people will have different things that get them into flow. If you're trying to focus on something that is not meaningful to you, your attention will just slip and slide off it. And the third is, it will really help if you choose a uh, um, if you choose something that is at the edge of your comfort zone, at the edge of your ability. So let's say you're a middle talent rock climber, right? You don't want to just climb over your garden wall. It's not going to get you into mm. flow. It's too easy. Equally, you don't want to suddenly tomorrow climb Mount Kilimanjaro. It's going to be too overwhelming. You want to choose a slightly higher and harder rock face than the one you climbed last time. So if you do these three things, narrow down to one goal, make sure it's a meaningful goal, choose one at the edge of your comfort zone, you'll maximize your chances of getting that deep gusher of attention.